Welcome to the Recruitment Mentors Podcast. My name is Hisham Azuz. Today, I'm really excited to be joined by Tony Phoenix Coles, who is the Managing Director of Digital Gurus. Tony entered recruitment straight out of university after graduating from the University of Leeds. And since that moment, she hasn't looked back. She's worked in the industry since 2006. Within that time, she's worked for multiple recruitment brands where she has consistently accelerated her recruitment career and progressed through the ranks. However, since 2011, Tony has worked for the Rethink Group where she has progressed from team lead, head of practice, and now uh, more recently becoming the managing director of one of the recruitment brands within the Rethink Group, Digital Gurus, to drive it forward. Tony, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. Oh, it's my pleasure. I'm really looking forward to chatting with you. Likewise. So we're recording this a day after England semis. So uh, <laughs> if either of us are quite on the ball, bear with us. Uh, good job we're not recording this. Yeah, good job we're not recording this. Uh, yeah, day after uh, Sunday on the on the Monday. I know, I know. Uh, so where we always like to start on this podcast is is really the which I'm I'm sure it's something that you've thought a lot about in your career, but basically it's the million pound question. Like in in your opinion, what characteristics and traits do you think make up a highly successful recruitment consultant? Okay, um, so in my experience, both personally and then everyone else that I've worked with, there's a few key themes that for me are just critical. So one is um, consistency, mm. absolutely vital. Um, hard work, but working really smartly. So like mm -hmm. the first few years in recruitment are by far the hardest. You know, you, you get paid more as the years go on and it gets a bit easier for you, but that's as your network grows and things mm. start becoming easier for you. So I think doing things consistently and always doing what you say you'll do at the time, uh, mm. it can be really, really small. Um, and for me, like just how either, either how organized you are or how much knowledge you can retain. Because again, you know, there's, there's one ecosystem, it's the, the same people and it's the same markets, et cetera, that you're working. But as your knowledge grows, if you start a really solid foundation and continually just work away at it, improving day by day, then I think it's almost a, a failure safe that you're going to be a successful recruitment consultant. Mm. Yeah, interesting. And then just, and, and then we'll talk more about this, but ju just interested, the consistency piece, that's obviously something that, yeah, you'd probably find a lot in yeah high performing recruiters is the question but like how how do you go about i guess identifying maybe a precursor to someone that could be consistent if they haven't got recruitment experience out of interest yeah. like what types of things would you look for these people to be consistent within their life then out of interest? for me I, I always like to see how well people can deal with like quite complex situations and it can be anything so okay. either something really complex that they've learned, you know, musical instrument, a different language, different subject, or just a situation that they've been in. And if they're mm. natural problem solvers, always looking for solutions, they think really broadly and open-mindedly, for me, that's a really strong example that they're going to have yeah. the right traits. Um, obviously, there's all the buzzwords, yeah? So resilience is critical. You know, this, this yeah. industry is really tough. Um, so I look for examples of where they've evidenced previous resilience before. Um, sure. Tenacity, always a buzzword that's there. But again, mm -hmm. you know, if you don't keep going, and, and that's why so many people drop out of recruitment within the first, you know, 12 months, two years, probably maximum three years. And then it, you know, yeah. I, I tend to think if they're in it longer than three years, they'll probably stay in the industry. Yeah, yeah. That is interesting. And then just because we're, we're talking about it, obviously you, you graduated university uh obviously and how much how many sort of um do you hire a lot of grads or have you in the past uh, or have done, really? but a degree is absolutely not necessary for recruitment yeah. in my opinion anyway yeah yeah sure agreed i guess the question was do you like in your personal opinion the sort of younger people coming through do you think they have more resilience or less resilience out of interest oh, that's harsh all my <laughs> My younger brothers and sisters, it's hard to say, you know, you can never be in anyone else's shoes unless you've been in their shoes, right? So yeah, yeah. as a stereotype, everyone's going to say they have it easier. Of course they are, but yeah. I, don't, I don't subscribe to that. Every individual is unique. Uh, that's the beauty of the world we live in, right? So yeah, yeah. Um, yeah I, I could not put that stereotype on. I'll treat everyone yeah, with yeah. individuality. 
No, I, I, I agree. It's just, obviously, you, you do see people say that, like, call it the snowflake generation or whatever you want to call it. And I was interested <laughs> to hear what you said. And, like, my my view is I was, like, on the cusp, really. I was born in 1993. And, like, for me, when I think of resilience of, like, I have a younger brother who's four years younger than me. And even below that, like, for me, resilience, like, if I had to go through school and my younger life, like, with, like, all the tools of today, social media particularly, all these types of things, so, like, let alone get through that without social media was hard enough and you had yeah. to have a bit of resilience absolutely like, let alone with social media to get through that be mentally strong or like feel like i i, I think yeah it's just a different type of resilience i think it's just different challenges it, is. it so is. That would have been so hard that would be so hard for people to go through that yeah agreed and i feel like it's our responsibility to use experience to try and nurture you know younger people and what they're coming through in terms of you know modern day problems that they'll face and the social media is a huge one around mental health and building up that layer of resilience i mean the yeah, world yeah. right now is crazy yeah exactly and just on this topic so where where i want to start obviously there's a lot here to sort of unpack really keen to focus on the last couple of years because i think uh, that's obviously what you're going to be really excited about what the future may look like the journey that you've been on but always like to start at the beginning i've recently been sort of interviewing uh, doing like a specific like 10 episode series focus on like entry level recruiters interviewing people that are sort of in their first year two years to hopefully help people that are entering or early stages okay. again with you and how you entered the world of work like knowing what you know now what advice would you give tony graduating out of leeds to, like if you were graduating this year like what advice would you give her out of interest if you're going into recruitment yeah brilliant question i think um being really truthful around what the job entails is the most important thing so rewind yeah. 15 years ago and, and it was a story i remember being so excited to accept this job i hadn't looked for any other job and that's because <laughs> really? i was done i was pre-closed <laughs> I, you know, I was so grateful for this 17 grand a year job i didn't even know i wanted it i just a friend recommended me he got a grand for it you know i was yes. just sold to all the way so i you know i would never do that I, I couldn't put anyone in that situation now because the reality of it is you're going to do that job for 35 40 hours a week you're going to think about it for x number of hours more you know that's, that's, <laughs> that's that person's life so um to try and answer your question i would say um do you love working with people uh it is a true meritocracy so the fact that you can have a huge amount of influence on your earnings, potential earnings, career, but it's also going to be around who the people are, the type of company that you work for. So I think if you're really um, competitive, then you know it's definitely going to be a rewarding career. But also, if you like to see progression, um, if you are really open-minded, and also maybe if you're quite passionate and quite technical about a particular area, because I, I do think if you learn a market, the best people for me are the ones that have it additional interest in that market as opposed yeah. to the market just being the vehicle of you know that that's their sphere if you will yeah yeah for sure yeah and, and it's really interesting and again i know it's like a buzzword progression but one of the th things that i've been asking these people is like what what is it that sort of your what type of recruitment business do young people actually want to work for like what yeah. actually lights them up what are they motivated by is it the opportunity to buy rolexes or go to ib for and these types of things and those things for sure these people will enjoy and you get that camaraderie and you make friends and that is definitely something people want but if that's sort of what you're leading with i think you're missing a trick because the real answer is progression that's yeah. what they want it's progression and i think that's that's what i think is great about recruitment and why it's such a great career choice and I think, uh, and I think that's that's what I think really needs to change. Is like it sh it needs to be less of an accident, I think, because it can offer people so many different things where they can right. take all of those different skills into different industries. Yeah, and I, it's, feel like um, we're, I feel like we're making some headway with that because we've had some people who I've hired in the past that have actually said to me, "I want to go into recruitment. I've researched it, and I was really surprised at that. Yeah, like, how have they researched it? But I've got a sister, and she's twenty two. And yeah. I, to go back to your question, I think, right, how could I? I mean, I wouldn't try and sell the recruitment industry to her because I don't <laughs> think it would suit her. I don't yeah, think she it as much. But actually, I think I hit a point when I was about 27. And yeah. I don't know if this was ego or anything, but 
all the skills that I'd acquired in recruitment, you know, the real transferable skills, being being confident, holding meetings, yeah. negotiation, et cetera. Um, I really felt like I could go out into the world and almost do any interview and hold a really successful interview. Now, obviously, I couldn't go and be a doctor because I didn't have those qualifications. Yeah, yeah. Anything that wasn't very, very specific quali qualifications, I felt recruitment. Given me all this, I backed myself, and I think anybody could do that. So, if, even if you're not that sure, it's such a rewarding career to develop you as a person. But then you, mm. you need the right company, don't you, that supports yeah, you, yeah. Or at least the right group of peers, anyway. Yeah, and and just on this point of like uh, early on, because it's interesting. Like you're completely right. So one of the questions that I've been asking them is like what has recruitment given you that you least expected so far and the most popular answer is confidence and right. i just think like how how many people in this world would love to be more confident in themselves yeah. and, and i think like there's been so many cool stories already where people were like look I, I wasn't the most confident person but now i've been in environments where i'm speaking to people that are much older than me different cultures etc yeah. and that's given them even, like you said like that sort of and then that's even like we're talking first two years first yeah. year in and they, they feel like that let alone five seven years down the track where you've got even more of these things so I think it's um amazing so just final point on this because I was keen to get your thoughts on it if you've um did you say that, that was your sister did you say it was yeah. 22 yeah. yeah so the thing that I've noticed I'm keen to get your thoughts on this something you may have seen in younger people perfectionism is something that I've like really noticed which I think is they're putting basically they're putting themselves under so much pressure for things to be perfect right and i just found that fascinating i don't know if you found that if it may be in your sister like they're so caught up on like i've got to get the perfect first job out of university this has to go well da, da, da. and like they're really concerned about everything like working out and they're like super young i mean i'm i'm only 28 but for me it's yeah. just like you double down on experiences rather than perfectionism like you're not going to know what you want to do unless you have more experiences, you taste more things, you know? Yeah, definitely. I haven't experienced that in my family situation. Like all my siblings are younger than me, but I can totally see where you're coming from. But I think that's, again, the responsibility um, of whoever's interviewing, whoever's going through those processes. Yeah. And, and maybe that's kind of the society that we're in. And it might be, again, attached to social media. Yeah, it could be, yeah. Yeah, it's com comparing, seeing your mates have got the perfect job in line with their degree and, and stuff like that. It's tough. Instagram story. You know, everybody's yeah, is. Yeah. You know, you got to take it for what it is. Yeah, for sure. So to, to wrap this up then, like, I'm keen to really, because from what I can see from your journey, obviously you worked at a few different companies and then obviously you've worked at, at th uh, Rethink for the longest. I'm really keen to unpack that. But like, how would you, always interested, like how would you describe your first like you said it's it's typically the hardest right you're building your network there's so much that you're learning like how would you describe your first couple of years in recruitment like was it really difficult like you said like you didn't really know much about like how would you describe your first couple Absolutely of years brutal. <laughs> really yeah i mean i was uh you know quite extroverted uh played sports played in university sports teams so culturally i worked yeah. in an environment it was an s3 company um, and you know, it, it is brutal. I was at my desk every day, half seven, because I was the newest, you had to get in to show willing, otherwise there yeah. was quite disdain. And then <laughs> you are the last to leave. I mean, I was really lucky. I lived about five minute walk away. This was in Leeds from the office. And I just oh, wow. thought, how, how is anyone else doing this job if they're traveling half an hour? I was knackered all day, every day. The expectations were really high, um, really out of my comfort zone, you know, cold calling, sounding mm. like an absolute wally. Um, but then also like learning a, a technical market, you know, like recruitment is recruitment, right? So we, we place people and hopefully we understand like the culture of organizations, but actually the, the specialisms, the real niches within those roles. I did Java development at the time. Um, I'm not the most tech savvy. I certainly didn't know what Java was. And yeah. I certainly shouldn't have been on the phone to CTOs, heads of development, job <laughs> developers, trying to just navigate my way through just talking, you know, a load of nonsense, really. So um, it's really, <laughs> really hard learning something. And and the expectations were really high. So yeah. I, I found it really tough. But I enjoyed it. I went out a lot, very sociable. And it got easier. But yes. Yeah. 
off. So a cu- couple of things there that I just want to unpack. So first one is, so you, so it seems like the way you describe that, like speaking to those types of people, not, not really knowing a whole lot, like you just push through and maybe had more of a mentality of like fake it till I make it sort of thing. It seems Have like. there's no choice. Yeah. Either okay. that or get sacked. So, so yeah. So, okay. So this is what I want to ask you because I'm sure you've seen that you've seen this turn up in, in people in your time of um, leading people. And this is really common. So around that period, I think some people can like, that can really paralyze them. And I don't, I don't want to label it with people like with imposter syndrome and like use that really easily. But like, that's typically the word that comes up. And I've definitely found this in interviewing less experienced people where they li- like the quote, that uh, has, <laughs> I found really funny was like this guy was like something I really found difficult was yeah speaking to MDs like these really senior people and two months ago I was sitting in the library like <laughs> preparing for my coursework yeah. where it is you know what I mean so like there is that like imposter that shows up like fucking hell like should I even be spe- like who am I to be speaking to this person and like so how what I don't know what it seems like you just like just yeah like you said there's no other choice but like what would your advice be to work through that for other people listening to this if, if they've got that showing up in there early on? In yeah, for me, a couple of key things that have really, like they're part of me and they've worked for me and it just took a little while to have the confidence really. So one is just always be truthful, always. Okay. Because the thing is, you can't argue with the truth. It is what it is. So whether you yeah. don't like it, unfortunately, because it's the truth, you there's never gonna you know you might have some re- regrets and all of those things so you know i'm new to this industry or i'm new to this market i haven't been doing this job very long here's what i'm trying to achieve i'm trying to i'm going to help you try and get a new role and use that to your advantage you know i have started yeah. so somebody else might ring you and they're going to be hitting kpis are going to be ringing 20 people i need my first deal more than anything you look like a great candidate i'm going to spend all my time getting you yeah, this yeah, job yeah. Um, to always just be truthful and then people you know hopefully good people they will um, they'll see through that in in the best possible way and then the other thing is recognizing that people are people so job title or not whoever you are speaking to is another person they're a human being we're all born I'd say equal okay yeah yeah for sure just accepting that and again you're going to have loads of people that haven't got the time for you and they're a bit rude that's about them not about you so if you're really mm. honest from the get-go about why you're making that phone call or what you're trying to do, if that person doesn't like it, that's more them than it is you. And then you just move yeah. on to the next one because not everybody will be like that. And then you've got those little golden nuggets and you've just got to take some celebration from those mini successes. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, I think, yeah, great. Own it, like you said, like just really own it. And just like like you said, there's you can't it's the truth right so that like own it and then yeah i i definitely got caught up on that on a bit on like just especially when sometimes a lot of recruiters start on the candidate side they get comfortable with that they're like right smash it now speak to loads of candidates and it's like oh right tony now i want you to do some bd like fuck i've just got used to speak to candidates well, now it's it. easier. yeah it's mental but the thing is they're all people no one's trying yeah, to tell exactly. you to talk from a robot to a dog to a person <laughs> yeah You're just talking from one person to another so get rid of all the labels in your head yeah exactly you're completely right so then the other point was like you said like you yeah you literally said like surprised how these people did it and traveled 30 minutes and i do think this definitely contributes as to why um the turnover can be high in recruitment is burnout and i think a lot of recruits can burn out in those first couple of years because of some of the things i do feel like the environment that you described i would say is less common in today's market might be wrong yeah so. I think I think I would like to think that most companies like the expectations of like if I don't show up at this time I could be fired like I feel like that's definitely been watered down for sure but like I don't know being through that yourself being involved in shaping cultures yourself now like I don't know for I don't know how can we go about making sure that yeah we're doing more to keep people in um recruitment in those early days rather than potentially grinding them to a halt and they're burning out do you know what i mean like how why why wasn't you why didn't you burn out like why was you able to just power through and yeah um i probably did burn out a few times uh, but okay. I, and I and i did actually consider leaving the industry a few times i took really? a lot of holidays um which helped <laughs> because i was doing well so i had more commission and that's how i spent any commission i ever got um but again like for me i just think it's mental like what are we actually trying to achieve right all businesses, mm. they're trying to achieve deliverables and output. 
So yeah. why is there so much interest in times and durations mm. and KPI? I, I, honestly, I think it is mental. I had this one lad who worked in our team and he was just useless in the morning. He hated it. He was a graduate. He'd probably yeah. been sleeping till two o'clock every day. And he must have been late, no word of a lie, four out of five days every week. I thought he was great, though. He had so much talent. He's actually gone and done them. Um, he's now a professional gambler in Vegas, right? He's always really? one, of his, like, yeah, it's one of his lifelong dreams. And do you know what? He handed in his notice with me 12 months early. He's on a four-week notice because we had such a good relationship, as I hope yeah. it would with most people, but it was to support him on his dreams. Anyway, the long and short of it, we just got rid of the hours. It was like, here's what I need you to deliver in a week. Yeah, I don't yeah, care yeah. when you do it, but we yeah. will have to have a conversation. Now, of course, there's downsides to that, which is what if the culture doesn't work, the team aren't all together? Well, the pandemic and working from home has proven that that's actually a load of nonsense. We all just had these yeah. preconceived ideas, didn't we, two mm. years ago? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right. So let's, <clears throat> let's talk a bit about um, – so obviously you joined – rethink recruitment in 2011 so by that by that point you is obviously quite established like you're being a recruiter and had you already had you always done like similar markets so or? i'd always worked in software development um yeah but when i mean i'll be really honest i, I yeah, wasn't still didn't love recruitment that much even though i'd done okay. it for uh i think about six years at the time i only yeah. took the job at rethink because it was in manchester and i'd a couple of things had gone wrong in Leeds, and I was like, I need a bit of a fresh start. Um, and actually, yeah. I said to the CEO at the time, I don't actually love recruitment. I don't value it that much. Um, yeah. And I, I didn't. It, it, for me, it felt really transactional, everything that I'd ever done. So, um, and I was just like, I'm just being honest, because if you're on it, like, almost going back to my original point, yeah. now he seemed quite taken aback from it, but he accepted that honesty. But he rang me about a week later and said, I'm just not sure you're for us, you know, because I need people to like the job. So I was backtracking a bit. Um, and then everything changed. When I joined this business, everything changed because I started really seeing the value of the job. So mm. like everything that you say, you know, everything that you say to candidates in terms of, I want to get you a really great job, one that fulfills you, what, you know, it's a lot of time. You spend more time at work than anywhere else. And then I was like, right, that's got to be for me. I've got to live and breathe what I'm saying to everybody else. And just the my lens changed how I viewed it. And actually getting people jobs that satisfied them, that made changes in their family or their choices. They were all the things why I got into recruitment. And I was doing that, mm. but in the tech world. So it then mm. became really, really satisfying and everything changed. Mm. So when you joined that business, did you join as a biller? Because it says like team leader, or was you managing a team straight away? Or yeah, billing team leader. So uh, which was I'd been doing that a little bit in my role when I was at a company in Leeds. Um, but I mean, it's really hard. Billing billing manager is definitely, in my opinion, the hardest of all. Yeah. The well, jobs. we're gonna talk. We're gonna talk about. We're gonna talk about that. So like, so just for clarity, then. So uh, obviously joined rethink at that point. And yeah. so how many, how big was your team that you had to manage when you joined? Four remember? people. Four people. Four people. Yeah. And was, you, was you doing a new market at that point then? Um, no, they they also did software development, but then it kind of, the, the markets had changed a little bit. So you work for some companies where it's very specific niche and you have to yeah. add a business away or you might get splits, et cetera. Whereas it was different at Rethink because if you kind of gone into a customer, you almost could own that customer, therefore do other roles with them. Pros and right. Problems. Really. Um, yeah, yeah. So yeah, similar. All always within technology, though. It's been my yeah, whole always within technology. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So then, obviously, stayed with Rethink for like nearly five years and progressed yeah. ahead of practice. Cool. So let's just talk a bit about this billing manager piece, then, if that's okay, for the next cool. sort of five ten minutes. Because as you said, it is a, it's definitely like one of the most challenging, and I always hear that. So first question I have for you then, because of the way that you join this business. How did you approach leading a team that didn't know you? Because normally it's like uh, you build well, someone gets a good opportunity, you've gained that respect, and it's like, oh, Tony's got the promotion, she's great, get it. But you, like that, you've gone into a position where like no one knows you, you haven't got trust, you're gonna have to establish that. Like you may even be doing, you might even now be doing a patch that you haven't quite done before. So like, how did you approach that out of interest? Okay, so twofold, really. Um, 
I've always had the attitude, I will, I wouldn't ask anybody to do anything that I wouldn't do myself. So from the get go, it could be mm. literally anything, doing any kind of awkward calls. I was just very front and center with everything I did. It's really important for me, lead by example, show that you're doing yeah. everything. Um, so I cracked on straight away, you know, making phone calls, having difficult conversations, always at my desk, always in front of people. Believe a lot in that coaching by being around, you know, that environment. You see lots of people walk off, don't you, in, in rooms doing those phone calls, either because mm. it gives them more self-confidence or because they don't want to be heard. Whereas mm -hmm. I just, I always just did everything as it was um, in front of everybody. And then the other thing was just, I had a, I genuinely really care about people. So getting to know them, finding common ground and just building relationships. So I just did that quite early and I, that comes quite easily to me. So mm. just building some trust within a team um, and then just being myself as well um, and leading yeah. from the front. It's got to be Got it. Got it. So obviously I know, obviously the, the sort of type of leadership role that maybe been in the last couple of years is a bit different. So I guess you can sort of tie this all together from maybe what you've learned, but just, just keen to, to learn really like, so what, what I continue to find speaking to agencies around like what learning development looks like for them and things like that, like a really common area, which is a, a quite typical blind spot is definitely the leadership piece because of the typical journey that billing managers will find themselves like that they'll go on or like it'll be the top billers that go into management or whatever right yeah. and a lot of the time they won't get any sort of leadership training or support on that they just have to yeah learn the hard way really yeah, yeah. Well, I guess really if cool. you yeah if you were to I guess encapsulate a lot of the things that you've learned maybe into like I don't know one to three things like if I'm some because a lot of people that listen to this will be aspiring leaders for sure like when we're sort of finding out um where people what sort of people's ultimate goals are for their careers it's it's either being a top biller or they want to lead a manager team so yeah. like <clears throat> knowing what you know now about leadership like and i'm on that journey at the moment i don't know what would your advice be for me like top three things that you think could have a real impact on me getting more out of my leadership approach or being a leader out of interest okay um i think listening is absolutely key so listening mm. to everything around you um really listening to your team taking the time to listen taking the time to listen to managers um the, the board you know anybody that's there because actually a lot of people in my experience they haven't done it's very tell focused um yeah. i think so just just on that sorry to butt in but i do want to say okay. it so i love that you started with that so are you do you are you familiar with the brand um gymshark yes yeah, yeah, yeah. So the reason why I bring it up, I brought this up recently, but I just think it's, I just think it's, it's meant basically. So I absolutely love um, Ben Frank. Ben like, I just love the journey. Yeah, I love yeah. the journey. I just think, I just love the way that he, I don't know, the way he comes across, big into humility, these types of things. But obviously, he brought in a CEO six or seven years ago, who, and like, and now he's just been announced CEO, and yeah. he's been on a few podcasts recently talking about why and da da da. And he said one of the main things that he learned from the CEO because he wasn't ready at the time was that people management piece. And the thing that's really stuck with me around this listening piece is something that like a bit of a mantra this guy always says is like, um, if you're going to ask how someone is and you're not prepared to listen to the answer, then you've got it wrong. Do you know what I mean? And yeah, I love the yeah. fact that you start with that yeah, listening. Yeah, I think that's so, yeah. like how many people, managers or leaders will go, hey, Tony, how are you doing today? And like, you know, they're not listening to your answer or like, oh, don't well, make the time um, to listen. Do you know what I mean? So like, that's no. the first thing, isn't it? Like this can all start from actually l listening like compassion yeah. listening really to your people did it yeah 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 nice. definitely definitely um i think like i'm fascinated by like sports teams and like, I, i've yeah. probably got i probably use quite a lot of football analogies because i like okay. that and my team will be laughing their head off if i've, I've got this classic one that i always say like and it, i'm kind of digressing a little bit now so it's okay it's okay bring you back in a minute but um i always say i don't need a team of number nines I do not need everyone <laughs> to be top, top billers firing in all the goals because actually no team has a team of number nines. You've got your James Milners, right? Yeah. You've got your, le your left backs, <laughs> your right wings, your keeper. I mean, how important is that goal? Yeah. So when when you've got this team and you've like less experienced people and joining businesses and they're nervous, and like how you know I'm so far away from that top biller and all their anxieties jump in. No one's asking you. No one's asking that whole, whole team to be top billers everyone can have an equal level of contribution by their input. 
So just yeah. to remember that. But I have digressed. So let's go back to leadership. No, it's okay. So we started with listening. Yeah, like really make sure you listen would be your like yeah. leadership advice from what you've taken on your journey. Yeah. What what else comes to mind? And then for me, um, I think why I said that was because it's kind of like I think of how sports managers are like. So yeah. for me, be, being a leader is being part of that team. So mm. thinking like in terms of flat hierarchy, everyone is equal. OK, some people have yeah. more experience. Some people have more knowledge. Everyone is equal. So having a leadership style where you recognize that that team around you, I wouldn't be anywhere without the people around me, my family unit, mm. my work unit. So it's spotting the team around you, what, what they're good at and where you can support them with and where you can challenge. But also acknowledging what your own ones are, you know, and being mm. really open with the team about that. And people, you know, that they... They empathize with that, you know, they have that understanding. And I think you build better relationships with your team. So for me, yeah. from a leader style, um, just being human. Um, and then if you know, for thinking of that category now of people that are wanting to become in those leadership roles, yeah. Um, start starting small. So mentoring somebody, offering themselves out, don't wait for somebody to come to you. In fact, here's another key one. I've never ever been in a position. I've always just, I call it assume as if. Mm. So I will act in that role anyway. I've always done that. So I was acting like the MD before I was the MD. I was acting as a senior consultant before I was even told I could be on the gateway to be a senior consultant. So act as if, yeah. you know, go and assume what some of those things are and just evidence them so that when those individuals move into that leadership role, it's as though they were already in that. Yeah, I love that. And and I've heard that a lot on here. So I guess I just want to just just sort of zoom in on that a bit, just that, just to hear what you would what you think. Like when you say act as if like how like how do you actually do that? Do you know what I mean? So like let's say I'm listening to this right now and I do yeah. want to be I do want to be the director of this business, etc. Like I, but I'm at the moment managing a few people blah blah blah. Like how can I actually go about showcasing that I'm acting as if I am that already is it just doing extra things or like is it a mindset thing like I don't know how does that actually so a bit of both so I guess depending on where you are exactly so if we kind of work from the, the top and we'll go down so if you're trying yeah. to get into that director piece there are things that a director is expected to know so I think there needs to be mm. some kind of self-analysis of where your knowledge is mm. for example figures right the, the financials do I know what a PL looks like do I even know what EBITDA means how does that mm. get broken down? Some businesses will have more knowledge and transparency around that and others. I mean, I've hired people before and they've never even looked at a PL because they've just been told, do this number, here's what you'll get paid at the end of it. But they're being kind of treated in this direct, associate director is what a lot of people yeah. would term it. So understand what it takes. And if you don't know that, you know, go and seek out that information, go and find out, go and learn it. Nothing, no one's going to stop you from learning that information. Some businesses are really cagey and wouldn't give all that information, right? Which is fair mm. enough. Go and learn what a PL is, what profit looks like, what true profit is, what contribution even means. So if you start talking in that language in and around the business and your understanding of it, you're going to elevate your position automatically. I mm. think um taking on more um so that that can be anything it's not necessarily doing more so just taking on more responsibilities you know it, you might yeah. i can't imagine there is a single person listening to this now that if i said to them what is wrong with your current business they couldn't give me an answer right but don't be a moaner about it go go mm. and find the solution and then present those solutions now loads of people will be sent back saying no, we can't do that. We've got this. And those frustrations will come out and those people might leave. And that's a shame for the business because they're going to lose good people. But yeah, go and answer all the problems that you're suggesting in your own head or hopefully not moaning about, but probably um, find the solution and present it. Yeah. No, I really like that. I really like that. Yeah. If you're listening to this and you have an idea of where you want to go, then I think, yeah, it starts with that self-analysis, doesn't it? Like what, if I do want to be a leader, then how are my leadership skills at the moment? It's all those things. Yeah. And then you can start there and then go well, and find that. So, step, and, sorry, sorry, I was just going to say, even like one step back from that, if you're a senior consultant and you've never managed anybody before, you know, you will, mm. you have a peer group around you. If you spot someone on the phone or that they're having a difficult time, sit by their desk with them. And just go and say, like, I thought that call was brilliant. How did you find it? 
and he, I didn't hear mm. all of it. Could you tell me a bit more about it? And just go and role model yourself in and around your environment to show that you're actively going and mentoring and supporting those around you. Yeah, and no, I really like that. And I, I love that practicality of like, <laughs> I love that practicality of like, yeah, what what things do you think the business could do to improve and taking that off your own back and then trying to come up with new ideas and things like that. I think that's a great way to show like what you're about. And yeah, I Definitely. think that's a great thing. And then the other insight that I've taken, that, which I think sometimes people miss. So, you know, you said that you really acted as if before you was an MD, you was MD. How many yeah. people around you knew that you wanted to be like you wanted to be where you wanted to be so what 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 i'm trying to allude to is like how many people did you communicate in to be like hey this is where i want to so you know this is where i want to get to this is where i'm heading like how how much of an impact did that have and is that something that you did out of interest yeah I'd, I'd, I'd say quite a lot of people um for me it's really important and to be that transparent with everybody around you um mm. because for one they've always got their own mind of where they want to get to so you're always assuming like that there might be leaders in our business now that think well tony's told me she wants to be the md for the next three years that means i now can't be it so i think it's also really important just to share like at the end of the day that there's a lot of growth um growth in the industry mm. growth in the market right now growth in businesses so just understanding that there are much broader opportunities and what that looks like so for me i would always talk about where I was at right now but in my career like in my personal life as well what things do I want to achieve mm. I always think talking about it setting those holds you really accountable also if people care about you which hopefully people do work in caring environments other people like want to get involved on how they can help get you there and how you could help and kind of that exchange yeah. of information you know why open source is yeah, yeah. as good as it has is because everyone's got together and they've, they've made these slight improvements themselves and it's a continually improving process Mm, yeah and yeah the, the reason why i bring that up is because i think again it comes back to our point of like not being so, like if you do want to progress your career you do want to accelerate then you can't be like the best chance you have of, of doing that is not being someone that sits there and waits for it to come to you and i think that sometimes some some people can miss that you know like if i work for your organization and i know i want to get to this position I want to make sure the people that are going to be involved in that decision know that's something that I want because the next time they're in some sort of board meeting or business decision meeting, they're going to go, oh, you know what, actually, I had a conversation the other day whilst I was making a coffee. He should really want that position. Maybe he's someone yeah. that we could think about. Do you get what I mean? So I think you've yeah, also got to be proactive. Have, yeah, I always have the same statement. Nobody can read minds. So yeah. again, whatever position you're in, no one can read your mind. Again, you hear a lot of people, don't you, moaning, I, I couldn't get this. Well, did you ask for it? Did you actually communicate to anybody? Because it's not actually mm. the employer or, you know, my, it's not my boss's job to always worry about my career. It should absolutely be an element of it, but it's my responsibility. Mm. It's my career. It's my responsibility. Yeah, exactly. So I'll, I want to talk to you before we finish. I want to talk to you about the DG journey. Uh, but before we go into that, I want to segue into a couple of things. So one, uh, women in recruitment. I want to talk to you about your journey with that. Two, I want to talk to you a bit about, yeah, how that then, I don't know, what's your journey been in like being um, a woman in a leadership position and a senior position, like how, what that journey has been like. Talk a bit about how we can maybe inspire more women in the industry. Uh, and then the other thing, which I think is, which is part of like what reempted me and you to reconnect on, on doing this was then the whole sort of raising a family and maintaining your career piece. Yeah. Okay. Um, cool. could we start there? Is that okay? Cool. Yeah. Just, so I guess the re the reason why I wanted to talk to you about it is because I think I would actually be appalled at the amount of like t terrible stories that you would hear from like just women wanting to go to raise a family they've worked their absolute socks off to get in a great position in their recruitment career and then like have to go through like a crazy journey of like one being terrified to tell their boss that they're pregnant then bring another human being into the world then raising them then like being with them for loads of time then being worried about coming back then like and like that being really difficult <laughs> and not being supported by the business they worked really hard with then being penalized potentially had a, a really great lady on recently called Bernadette who basically said like she was a contract recruiter and yeah she like she got promised things that she didn't get delivered she got told she's gonna keep certain things she's gonna get bonuses 
but she oh, didn't wow. get them right so i guess and i'd be i'd be so confident there'd be so many stories like that so i think okay. it's just yeah it's just really important i think to make sure that um women listen to this know that like if they have gone through that it's not like not that it makes it any better but at least they like so i guess what what's been your journey like how how difficult have you found it to raise a family maintain your career like you really strike me as someone that's clearly been career driven focused wanting to achieve have have big dreams so like how have you gone about maintaining that and maintaining your career aspirations as well as your personal family aspirations as well yeah okay so for me <laughs> it's always family first um it's really tough but you know what if i didn't have a family you can't tell me that people who don't have families also have easy lives again like you just can't judge anyone until you're in their shoes so yeah i've had two yeah. kids uh, in the last my eldest is three so even just like being pregnant you know was difficult i was really lucky i didn't mm. have any qualms telling anybody i think at the time i was a regional director um yeah. just communicated it okay i did only take six months off so i say only that was a personal choice of mine i was really passionate about the brand like digital gurus hadn't existed in the north and that was like my baby at the time so yeah taking that time out and having my son, it was really weird, right? So I had a cesarean, which meant yeah. it was a planned cesarean. So I worked until the Friday. Um, sorry, I worked until the Thursday. My cesarean was on the Friday. Wow. And I was still, I was still emailing everyone in the morning. <laughs> wow. Like you, you wait the hospital, you've had some emergency cesareans have happened, so you're a little bit delayed. And I'm just like still in work mode. So that was weird, but that's my personality, right? So, and it, it took a little while to kind of switch off because then the baby is there and they need you like fully. Um, and then my second time round, my little girl is now 10 months old. So I took seven months out. I was really good with this. I, I did give myself all the time off because I think you need these breaks and these resets. So whether you go off yeah. and have a baby or you have a sabbatical or you have a long holiday, like everyone says, God, if I have a two week holiday, like, wow, I, I did actually switch off on day eight. And you're like, right, okay. That's <laughs> um like life's too short for only switching off on day eight but it, it happens right because the, the the job is mental isn't it it's non-stop yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's one job where you will never ever finish because there's always more you can do which is kind of what we love about it as well so i think doing all of that uh it's been really hard balancing emotions because yeah i'm quite an emotional person anyway um but like this morning classic example football last night I had a couple of wines I took mm. both my children to nursery so I, um and they were both upset when I dropped them at their room we just moved house so they're in a new nursery so they both cried as I dropped them off right that was yeah. really hard for me I'm in the car I then burst out crying so I'm like then gotta calm myself down and be like right like, where are the practicalities will they be all right is the nursery safe or, will they be happy yes 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 thinking I've got this podcast thing. I'm really, <laughs> I, I, don't, I never carry makeup around with me. So that's <laughs> on haywire. Um, and that, that's just the reality of it. But for me, like, I'll just talk about that because again, going back to my original point, that is just what has happened. That's not me being crazy, me being emotional. That is just yeah, what has yeah. ha happened today. So if I can't share like the, what's happening, then what's the point of anything? So yeah, yeah it, it's really hard. About, um, but... I was I was just going to say, what about? I've heard it. I've heard it a couple of times where sort of uh, people have shared like when they've come back from maternity, their confidence can be at like an all time low, like really low. Where because there's so many different things going on, like leaving your child for the first time, these things. Did yeah. you experience any of that? Like, did you have to maybe rebuild a bit of confidence? Or yeah um it was probably for me less about the confidence as it was managing extra stuff like your head is already very full so when you yeah. come into work you're only talking about work i mean how many times have we heard in recruitment you leave your shit at the front door you're here to work now <laughs> hey, like yeah. that is the most bizarre sentence i've ever heard right because if we were <laughs> robots that might be quite easy however of course there is a level of professionalism where you have to try and compartmentalize things i fully get that but i think just um for me, 
it wasn't so much about the confidence, more just the emotions that go with thinking, are, is my child safe today? Are they okay? Mm. What are they doing? And then things happen, like even tonight, I really want to pick my kids up. My CEO is in uh, Manchester, up from London, and mm. we've got some time together at half four. For me, it's really important to have that time with him. If I said to him, um, could we move that forward? 100% wouldn't care. But like, of course, get home to your kids. But actually, I also need a full day with my team. So it's just prioritizing everything. And the one thing that I will say to any female is, regardless of how organized or efficient you were before, and, and I felt that I really was, it is new levels once you've had a kid because there's <laughs> no crap that doesn't need to be done. My, my efficiency levels are through the roof. Really? If something doing and gets talked about it gets done and talked about because i am leaving at a certain time it's not like where you're just a bit late and your partner's pissed off with you because you're now home late like my kid needs picking up so i'm getting all of this done today because it has to get done today so if anything i had a bit of an advantage coming back i would say yeah i love that right so let, let's talk about dg like last sort of 15 minutes or so let's talk about the journey in dg because i know that you shared with me and i know you won't mind me saying like obviously joined uh, DG when they got acquired by the Rethink Group in 2016. Yeah. And like you said, it was like your baby because they didn't have a presence in the North. And that was something that you obviously took on and was a really exciting opportunity for you. So like, I guess what, what I was keen just to dig into initially, and then we can finish by like where it's at today, how you've sort of navigated things in the last 12, 18 months, how it's gone, how you're thinking about the future. But like, Obviously, with them not having a presence, and it was more down south that they did have a presence with other places internationally as well. Like, talk to me about, like, what was, I guess, what people would be interested in is like, how did you go about um, expanding this brand up north in the most effective way? Ultimately, like, you, most recruiters, listeners would have had to build out some sort of desk from scratch before build a business, like how did you go about building the dg brand in up north out of interest what ended up being your strategy and how did okay. it go um a couple of prongs to that one was internally um creating a culture you know a raw fresh culture which was very values driven so what are the values i felt were important and then communicating those with potential people to join that so what we did we built yeah. something ourselves and we harnessed it and it grew and it was just so real and wonderful. And it's continued to grow with that, but it's obviously adapted as the years have gone on. Um, yeah. But externally, in terms of actually even just having that brand presence, we, um, at the time, so events and networking wasn't really a massive thing then. Like everyone did a thought leadership something or perhaps a round table. Um, but I built this group, we called it Digital North, and it was just to kind of use the same word. And it was kind of a privately owned group, like private in that you had to request access to it, which I, I know yeah. goes against a bit what I was saying before about the open source element, but it was more so to ensure that the quality was really high. Right people, and what, yeah. Yeah, and what we did, we just gave really, really good content and just shared everything. And again, just the, the truth of everything, people like genuine issues that businesses were having at that time. So really not that dissimilar to what you're doing, but within the tech space, and yeah. what we found was it just grew like next level. And if anything, Digital North became bigger than Digital Gurus. No one even wow. really knew Digital North was a Digital Gurus thing. Um, yeah. So we were a team of recruitment consultants doing a, a presence in the North. It was it was amazing. You know, the, the pandemic's obviously not that because for the last couple of years. But then I was really fortunate. Um, I was able to get our board to invest in the office space in Manchester. So like most yeah. places have offices and then they, they've all got like an event space within their office. Yeah, yeah. Whereas I was able to get the money to flip that on its head. So we actually have an event space that we have desks in, if that wow. makes sense. Yeah, so yeah. And, that, and that was game changer because we had so much flexibility for us. I mean, to be honest, no one needs the investment to do that. Anyone could do that. Um, but I put more focus and also, how people want to be, you know, fluidity. They can sit where they want, let them work. Mm. If they want to work from the sofa, if they want to work from the dining room table, if they want to work from home, like, what's the big deal? Let people work where they feel the best and then support and encourage around that. So yeah, that's yeah. what. Okay, cool. Got that. So that's been, so, and then just, just trying to make it, I guess, just a bit more practical or I guess thing, like how, how did that then, I get the, um, 
how that would have i personally i get how that would have sort of massively helped you but like how did that then actually translate into like business and you were like was it because you had the reason to call people and you form relationships that way was it just that you're just building great relationships yeah a, a little bit of all of that but again going back to my original point it's like it's whatever's happening for you right now so what was happening for me at that time was i had lots of recruitment experience i was excited by bringing what was a very reputable brand up to the north so everybody that i was speaking to i was just sharing that story because that is what was happening right now yeah. people like stories and the the truth and they you know if it is genuine and real people like that so yeah. it wasn't hard to be honest uh you just mm. got to put in the effort and communicate it you know you've got to put in loads of hard work if you're not communicating anything nobody's going to know anything but even just talking to businesses customers new clients around what's going on and how you can help um it worked for us okay cool so let, let's talk about more recent times and the last yeah let's just let's just keep it like i guess pre-covid and like covid world and how you've gone about growing dg okay. i um because i i spoke to and hopefully this will this will make sense but tried to reach out to a couple of people in your team to see if there's any questions they'd love me to ask you and uh yeah, spoke spoke to Jay and he mentioned that uh, sort of he he thought it'd be interesting for you to share like why you've decided to employ the uh, Spotify model at DG. So like I think the tribe piece, which I think I've seen, okay, um, and what like what why the benefits or like why you've gone down that angle. So maybe I don't know. Is that enough to prefix like I don't know what maybe things look like before you decide to go down that path? Is that does that make sense? Maybe yeah, talk a bit about that. I guess in my experience, something that had always worked, obviously the reason why, one of the reasons why I love the job so much is like the whole UK economy is run for me on technology. So any potential yeah. client that we're working with will have some form of technology. And something I always took extra interest in, there's the tech piece itself, but like I said, I'm not that technical. So it's the people that I'm passionate about and the culture and the mm. performance of how those teams are built. But if I saw a business doing something that I either really liked or really disliked, you know, you use that knowledge. That's how, kind of how people do navigate. You know, they, they take some of the best bits and hopefully, again, with bosses in recruitment, the bosses, mm. whether you do stuff that you hate what they do, you make sure you never do that, don't you? <laughs> yeah. So um, what I noticed was um, we'd had loads of successes taking some of the good stuff from other companies and I'd seen the Spotify engineering model. And as mm. I was just watching it, I was like, wow, this sounds so like where we are, but also where we want to be. So the key piece in it really is around having these like small self-organized autonomous teams. And mm. actually a lot of our success, particularly like in the, the pandemic, it's crazy how well we've done really. And I feel so fortunate but part of that is because the teams operate really autonomously and mm. building these smaller identities in these smaller teams and kind of how we've segmented them, which, yes, it's in tribe squads and chapters. So to align with Spotify, um, it's just really worked for us. So I'm really passionate about that. Mm. So it's the autonomous, Pete, that this is really important. And then how, how big are these, like, how big are these groups typically? And then is it the, so they all have their own niches? And like their yeah, own worlds so there. I guess to I'll, so if I use technology as one technology is one of our tribes it happens to okay. be the biggest one so within yeah. our tech tribe we have I think we currently have nine squads so for example cloud is a squad within our tech tribe right, development is a squad within our tech tribe so then each person within those squads so they might we might have 10 dev consultants they'll each work in different chapters so it might be basically different mm -hmm. languages but then there's how that whole dev function works. They kind of share a lot of ideas, but it doesn't mean that they can't work with other squads. And that's kind of how the Spotify model is run as well. So they're very self-optimized teams, but then almost it's not about me setting standards. It's about the teams understanding what works well for them, sharing that information, collaborating a lot. And then almost the de facto standard becomes the one that works the best for everybody, but it's decided by the teams. Wow, so interesting. Yeah, I get that. So you've got obviously tribes, then you've got squads, and then you've got chapters within the squads. Yeah. Okay. So what about how do you make sure like how like obviously your position within that then is to a part of the position, part of what you do is make sure that everyone is, although everyone is 
sort of running their own sort of squad and working what works best for them, etc. Obviously, there's got to be a sort of golden thread, hasn't there, of like, this is where we're on, this is where we're heading. So yeah. how, how do you tie that in now? Because I feel like business owners or people will be thinking about that the way you describe that. Like, okay, well, how do you make sure that we're all aligned on the same vision and mission? Like, how, do you, how have you gone about interweaving that? So three key things that I hold by. One, always higher on the right values and behaviours. So within that, you always know that there is alignment from the get-go. Never, ever just hire on financial results. Like, that's mm. an absolute no. Um, second to that is around communication. I personally don't think you can communicate too much, right? So there, there is a balance with that. But for me, I will regularly say to all staff members, again, like no hierarchy here. Here's where we're up to. Here are the financial results. Here's what we're trying mm. to achieve. Here are the things that we've messed up on. Uh, here are the levers, here are the stuff, like all that information, communicate that really, really regularly. Uh, and it can either be a WhatsApp to all DG, it can be a group email. I've got actually everyone in the Manchester office tomorrow where we're going to run a almost like a full day of session with like different components to it around like yeah. high performance, data analytics, et cetera. Um, so yeah, they're, they're the key things for me. And then just finally, um, consistency. So whilst you're communicating a lot, if something's not working, that's absolutely fine. But at least then communicate that we're no longer doing it. Because again, mm -hmm. a massive error for me was a consultant like, oh yeah, we did that again for a few weeks, and then that fell by the wayside. And oh, oh yeah, the yeah, you hear that a lot. Doing it. Like it's nothing more frustrating. So again, like think we do do things, and then they do fall a bit by the wayside. But then just acknowledge it. We're no longer doing this because of X, Y, Z. Or we're going to try this now. So I think just the openness to allow the agility is what yeah. people buy into yeah yeah two, two final things before we finish one always here obviously recruitment businesses str struggling to scale and hire for their own businesses so interesting you said like always 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 hire on values not on their financial track record so just real quick what's been your journey or experience on getting that right in terms of like how do you actually go about evaluate like how do you go about testing someone on your values like how do you go about that in an interview process out of interest how's that evolved yeah how have you got better at that so has every person i've hired been exactly perfect <laughs> absolutely no of not. course yeah um, yeah and some crazy stories like you wouldn't even believe what and you know I, i've obviously fallen guilty of believing somebody and then having the wool pulled over your eyes and i, I you know <laughs> i'd like to think i'm a good judge of character but that's for another day because there's some really mental stories so i think for me just getting to know the person you know over time you you do have your gut instincts but it's for me it's also important to have database decisions not necessarily um like gut based decisions there's got to be a bit of both so get to know the person question them about loads of different things you know get evidence always get references now i've, I've fallen yeah. down i've not got references why would you not um from your internal staff which is just crazy that people don't always do that and then um just letting other people like never never meeting someone and assuming that because you think they're amazing that everyone's going to think they're amazing doesn't matter that i'm the md everybody that's going to be related to that person in the first instance should have an opinion on them. So getting other people involved, it can be anybody within the business just to create a level of objectivity. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. And then on, on the science piece, have you used any, do you use like psychometric testing or anything like that? Or I have not? used, yeah, I've used plenty of those in my time. I think if you can get a really good one, they're definitely useful, uh, but they should always, in my opinion, just kind of be complementary as opposed yeah, to... Yeah, like add to like how you're thinking about things or yeah okay and then the final point and then we can end on like yeah how we're like how things are looking for dg and where where uh you guys are heading but just just a, obviously you said that like really fortunate that as a, as a business you've performed well uh, the question really is like why why do you think you and the, the team have been able to thrive uh during and i'm sure there's been challenges obviously along the yeah, way but almost. like overall looking back now as we sort of really start to come out the other side that you are in a positive position why do you think that is i think partly due to the hiring strategy so the the team that is currently in dg and that has been all the way throughout the pandemic they're they are nice people they are nice genuine people they want <laughs> 
everyone else to do well. It's not just about themselves. So our collaboration is off the charts. Every time you will hear somebody sharing or doing something, and that that's really genuine, and that's ingrained as part of our culture. Um, so I think that's been a key thing. But mm. then also, you know, it does take time to build high performance and also a strong culture. So I think we just we benefited from a couple of years previous where we were almost aligning ourselves to here's what we're building on here's where we're trying to get people to some people really you know we've had like loads of personal bests but again it's because we've got a group of people who again going back to my original point that i said earlier the solutions providers so we're, we've all been faced with a problem um so it's mm. how can we try and create a solution to the problem that we're in which could just be there are less jobs you know no one's spending people are getting rid of people it's finding the solutions around all the granular stuff and that's what we've been able to translate into what they've been the mini successes that has contributed to an overall success. Love it. Final question then, obviously, was uh, made MD in April this year. So, like, what does the future hold next five, 10 years? Like, what's the, what's the vision? Like, obviously, uh, from the DG's point of view, from your point of view, how would you describe the future? Uh, well, the future, lots and lots of growth. Um, in everything. So growth of the people, growth of the staff, where they're going to go on their own personal journeys, growth of customers and clients, growth on the top line and the bottom line, which is where we all want to be, growth of markets, growth of offices. So I'm just really excited about all of that. Um, yeah. And then for me, I, you know, I, I want to take it all the way. So I've got one more job title ahead of me. So the CEO knows that I want that. Well, you want to see what you're going to be CEO? Yeah, I think so. Love that. Yeah. Okay. Nice. Um, and, and, you know, and the reason why I say I think so is that's not right now. So yeah. in two, three, four years, whatever it may be, if I'm in a position and I want that, then hopefully I've put myself in a strong position and acquired any additional skills that I need now to be successful in that. Love it. Can't wait to see it. Tony, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank oh, you so much. Same. No, thank you so much.